Bonjour, comment allez-vous, monsieur and mademoiselle? I took French for one year in high school in Holly Springs, and I tell you what, there's my French. I know a little bit of a song, but I won't sing it for you today. Good morning, I'm Doug. Welcome to Pray First. It's a good Thursday. I hope you're having a good week so far. It's just about over. You know, we say that nowadays. People work all through the weekend all the time and everything else, but still, the, the five-day traditional work week is just about over. I hope you're having a good one. Hope you're ready for Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, we've been talking about um, how precious you are, how valuable you are, and how unique you are. You know unique, Nick. You know you're unique. I mean, just look at you. Just, I mean, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Your fingerprint is different than everybody's fingerprint on earth. Your DNA is different. There, God made He loves you. He yearns for you. That's what we've been talking about. So if you've been missing the past couple of days, go back on my page, Pastor Doug, and watch that. Hashtag live if you're here at the 7 a.m. hour. Hashtag recorded or pre-recorded if you're watching this at any other time. And right now, while you got an opportunity, if you have a share button, go ahead and share this video out so people can join us right here at the Pray First broadcast live, or maybe they'll watch it during the day uh, from the post that you put out there. Today I want to talk about the relationship between the father and the older brother in Luke chapter 15 and something that he missed. So before we do that, you guys who are first-time people here at Pray First, we love you, and we appreciate you coming. We appreciate you pushing on that button and clicking on this and watching this video. We hope that it's meaning something to you, and we have a Pray First family that's growing daily from literally all over the world. So we want to welcome you guys. So my family out there at Pray First, all of y'all, start hitting those hearts, hitting those likes if you can. I mean, go crazy. You know, we tear them up. We go nuts. We say this every day. Woo! So it's so good to have you since I can't do that. There's my thumbs up and there, there's my hearts. We love you guys. Luke chapter 15, verse 31. I'm going to jump right in. Here we go. I'm also going to be sharing with you a little bit today about my trip uh, to the monastery. So Luke chapter 15, verse 31. The conversation between the father and the older brother in the parable of the prodigal son. So here's what the father says. The younger brother is upset that the, I mean, the older brother is upset that the younger brother has come home and he has lived his life crazy. He did not uh, take care of his responsibilities. He wasn't there to help with the family business. He wasn't there to help with father. He just kind of took everything and ran. He's now come back and the father is so excited, welcomes him home, kills the fatted calf, prepare, prepares a celebration, gives him a robe of righteousness, slips the family signet ring back on his finger and the older brother is hot because he feels like the father has not given him the same attention. Here's what the father's response is in Luke 15, 31. My son, the father said, you were always with me. I want you guys out there, this is interactive if you've never been here before. Uh, all of us like to interact with this, so hashtag with me. The father responds to him and he says, my son. First of all, he tells him who he is. You have a place in this family, son. You're not an outsider. You're not a slave. You're not a hired hand. You're not an acquaintance. You're not a friend. You are my son. My son the father said, you are always with me, hashtag with me, and everything I have, son, is yours. Everything I have is yours. I want us to focus right now on what the father tells the son. You're always with me. Everything I have is yours. Remember, this analogy Jesus is giving is God the father to us whether we're prodigals or older brothers or in one of those stages, because you can go through those stages in your life. Guys, God is always with us. He calls us son. He calls us daughter. You not only have his image and his likeness, as we said yesterday, you're his child. And when you're out from under, when you've walked away and when you're ignoring God, it's as if he has lost a child not just with his look, not just with his spirit, but his very heart. It's like taking a piece of his heart away. God says, son, daughter, you're always with me, and everything I have is yours. Come here, come here. This is so important. In this story, the older brother was living in the house with the father, 
but he was not communing with the father. Come on, come on. The older brother was living in the house, but he was not communing. Hashtag communing. And let me define what communing means because that's not something we use on a daily basis. It doesn't mean that, you know, if you're evangelical in the South or maybe in the world, you get a little cup and a little wafer and you commune with this blood, you know, and his memory of me and this body was broken for you. And, you know, that's not. Here's what communing means. Communing means sharing one's intimate thoughts. Sharing, sharing, not presenting, sharing one's intimate thoughts, sharing one's intimate feelings with someone, especially when exchanged. So it's not just a one-way thing. There is an exchange of intimate thoughts and feelings. Guys, the older brother was living in the father's house, but he was not exchanging intimate thoughts. He wasn't exchanging intimate feelings. He was not communicating or communing with the father. Guys, you can be in proximity to someone and not be with someone. You can go to church and not experience God. You can read the word and not experience God. You can pray and not experience. You can be in proximity to someone and not be with someone. Exodus chapter 25, God is giving the uh, blueprints to build the ark to Moses. And he says, I want it to build this wide, this tall, this long. I want rings on these corners. I want gold here. I want a certain kind of wood here. I want you to build a mercy seat. I want you to have cherubs on it. I want you to build it in such a way with the wings covering the mercy seat. I want you to have poles going through those rings. He's giving him defined detail on how to build the ark because that's where his presence was going to be. And in uh, Exodus 25, 22, he says, And there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you. Exodus 25, 22. In that place, there I will meet with you and I will speak with you. I want to ask you a question. Are we meeting with God and speaking with God? Or are we meeting with God and speaking to God? Big difference. There's a big difference in meeting with and speaking with or communing, exchanging intimate thoughts, exchanging intimate feelings, and coming and speaking to. You can speak to a wall. You can speak to a rock. You can speak to something. You can be in proximity to something and not be with something or be with someone. Are we meeting with and speaking with God? There's a difference in meeting with and speaking to. Back in the 80s, there was a huge push about this two-word combination. How many of you know what the church has always said, you need to have these two words so that you can speak to God. You need to have a, it's two words, starts with a Q, Q, it's QT. You a QT, woo, you QT. Anyway, uh, you QT, uh, it's quiet time, quiet time. And people were making manuals and books and they were making folders and tri-folders and all kinds of things to put in it. And each day you had about, you know, scriptures to read, you had prayers to do, you had, I mean, we took these things called quiet time and we turned them into uh, responsibility time. We had to do all these things. We had to read a couple of chapters. We had to read a couple of verses. We had to pray for about 15 people. We had to do this. We had to do that. And and it was like, read a bunch of chapters, pray for a bunch of people. And you're just like, <gasps> and, and, and not only that, you had to do it between like 4 a.m. and 4, 4.02 a.m. I mean, you had to put it in early. You had to get up, <gasps> And, and do these things, it became more of a stress and responsibility. And then you got behind. You got to read your Bible in a year. You've got these verses to read today. You've got these chapters to read. Guys, there is a good thing to that, and there's a bad thing to that. How many of you know that God's presence was not isolated to the ark? God was trying to get Moses and the people to focus on something. Some of us can't focus on something without a pattern. I understand that. You can have a pattern and it still not be a, a self-imposed responsibility. We get frustrated, we're freaking out. God's word, come here, come here, come here. God's word is written, yes. God's word is written. It's written within the pages of scripture. God's word is written. We should read it. We should meditate on it. We should hide it in our heart that we might not sin against God. But God can speak to you without you reading it. 
You hear me? God can speak. Hashtag God speaks. God can speak to you without you reading it. I want you to ask yourself if you have a quiet time or you have a time you talk with God, are, are you meeting with God? Are you meeting with him personally? Are you meeting with him on a daily basis? Or are you meeting with a self-imposed responsibility? It's a big difference. It's a big difference in meeting with God uh, with, as, as, as if it's his responsibility and meeting with him daily and communing and listening and shutting up. We don't have to talk all the time. We don't have to be praying about or for something all the time. We can just say, God, I'm hurt. I'm frustrated. I'm tired. God, I can't get out. I'm not rolling out of this bed. I'm not going to the quiet time chair. I'm not reading the chapters in Mark today. I just want to... I just want to be in your presence. I just want to experience you for a minute. Here, you're, you're hearing all about me. Let, God, let me hear about your day today. God, tell me how my day is going to go. I've been telling you how my day is going to go. I don't tell you about how tomorrow is going to go. Oh, it's Monday. Oh, it's Friday. Ah! No, no, no. God, you tell me how my day is going to go. The older brother in Luke 15 was in the house, but he wasn't with the father. He was in the church. He was in the responsibilities. He was doing the stuff. He was serving, but he wasn't with the father. So let me tell you these things real quick about my experience in a cornfield in Kentucky. I had the most incredible opportunity to go to a place called the Abbey of Gethsemane. Uh, just outside of Bardstown, Kentucky. Uh, for those of you bourbon drinkers, uh, that's the, like the bourbon paradise is in Bardstown. And then Elizabethtown, or the E-Town, is not far from there as well, in Kentucky, in the middle of a cornfield. Uh, this place, you have to be booked up like four months in advance. Um, so many people are trying to get in there because it's a place to be quiet. You have no responsibilities. There is no structure. There is no planned activities. There are no planned classes. Uh, there are services throughout the day that you can attend or not attend. You have no schedule. You just go, and I'm telling you, you be quiet. What an awesome, awesome privilege and a, uh, a, a, a something for me to do, opportunity for me to do. Uh, so I went there, and the Dalai Lama, I'll tell you how big this place is, the Dalai Lama of India has been there twice, to be quiet. The Dalai Lama, that's exactly right. I'm not talking about, you know, somebody's mom, I'm talking about the Dalai Lama, the real one. So I really put a lot of pressure on God. I was going to Kentucky to hear from God, to hear him. I want to just put out everything else around me and hear from God. So one afternoon, I climbed up on top of this hill, and if you saw some of my pictures, if you're on my Facebook, I took a picture of me sitting on this hill with the skies were pink and everything. You could see all the way around. I got up on top of this hill and I said, God, what you got? And to be honest, I was feeling a little bit of pressure for God to speak to me. I really felt like God had to tell me something. I needed to get it here. This is going to be the time. I got to get it in between this time. God, say something to me. As I looked out off that hill and I was sitting up on top of that hill in a chair, I was a cornfield in front of me, a giant cornfield. And he said, go touch the cornfield. And I said, go touch the cornfield. He said, yes, go touch the cornfield. And I was like, ah, oh, this is just me. This is not God talking. Come on, God, strike some lightning. Show me an angel in the sky. Do something. No, no, go touch the cornfield, Doug. I'm like, how do you touch a cornfield? But I got up out of my chair and started walking down the hill. Down, 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 down. And then I started seeing these tracks. And I was like, man, there's some tall grass over there. I don't want to get ticks on me but there was truck tracks going right through them to the cornfield that I saw. And he said, get in one of the tracks. So I got in a track and walked to the cornfield. As I looked out over the cornfield, God said, son, how many stalks of corn do you think's in this cornfield? And it was huge. Like, God, I don't know how many stalks of corn are in this cornfield. He said, that's right, but I do. He said, son, how many ears of corn do you think is on the stalks in, these, in this cornfield? And I said, well, I don't know. There's two per, and he said, uh-uh, some of them only have one, and some of them have none, and some of them the deer have come and taken them away. The raccoons have come and taken them away. And I'm like, okay, I don't know how many ears of corn are in this cornfield. He said, yeah, but I do. It's like, okay. He said, how many kernels of corn do you think is on this ear of corn? In, how many kernels of corn do you think is in this entire cornfield? And I said, I don't know. I said, yeah, but I do. He said, son, you want to change the world, yet you don't even know how many stalks of corn is in this singular cornfield just outside of Bardstown, Kentucky. I started feeling really tiny and really small because I, I want to do something significant for people. I want to love people. I want to help people. I want to bring God and people together. I want to do that. 
So he says, son, not only do I know how many stalks of corn are in this field, how many ears of corn are in this field, how many kernels of corn are in this field, I know how many kernels that were here last year, how many stalks, how many ears, next year's, and I know how many is all over the world. I know every time a deer takes one away. He said, son, go over to that ear of corn and touch it. So me, I had to go over there and touch the corn, but I pressed the corn kernel and kind of busted it, and I could smell the fresh corn smell. He said, Doug, God said very clearly, Doug, you've just affected the entire population of corn. Now I've subtracted a kernel of corn from the kernels of corn in the universe, and you have significantly altered that kernel of corn's uh, purpose and its uh, ability. It could have been this, it could have been that, but you have significantly, and when you altered that singular kernel of corn, it altered that ear of corn. Now there's not as many kernels on that ear of corn, but I know it. There's not as many kernels in this field of corn, and I know it. And each time a kernel falls to the ground, I know it, and I subtract it. Each time a, a, a corn blooms and makes an ear and kernels begin to form, I add it. Things are ever changing, ever growing, ever declining. The Lord give, the Lord take it away. Son, you don't know that, but I do. Trust me. Rest in me. Rest in me. I'm powerful. You don't have to do everything. You don't have to force everything. You don't have to stress about who's going to do this and who's not going to do that and what you're going to do. You need to leave space for me to do what only I can do. Psalm 46 verse 10 says, Be still and know that I am God. Some of you are struggling over some things your children are going through. Some of you are struggling over some things going on in your marriage. Some of you are struggling over some things going on in your ministry. Some of you are struggling with addiction, struggling with fear, struggling with doubt, struggling with unforgiveness. You need some time to take a breath and be still. You don't even know how many blades of grass are in your yard. Must less the world, but God does. And every time the lawnmower goes over someone's yard, he subtracts the length of the blade of grass. God is in control. So I walked away from that cornfield and God said, listen, I ask you to touch the cornfield. You ask me, how can I touch an entire cornfield? He said, touch the kernel in front of you. Guys, we've been called to love the world. We've been called to change the world. And if we think we, we, we have some power to do so, and we have some knowledge to do so, and we have some ability to do so, it will be like trying to boil the ocean. One of my elders, Alex Starker, told me that one time. Stop trying to boil the ocean. Pay attention to what's right in front of you. Love your neighbor. Love your friends, love your spouse, love your enemy who is standing in front of you. God said, Doug, when you touch that kernel of corn, you touch the entire cornfields all over the world and its potential changed. Whew. The next night I'm sitting up on top of that hill and God tells me to go down that path again. This time he says, do you think you can find the kernel of corn that I told you to touch yesterday? And I was like, I don't know, God. He said, you can if you follow the path I led you in yesterday. So here's the two things I want you to get and I want to pray for you. Number one, leave space for God to do what only God can do. We are sheep, not pack mules. We need some time to be quiet in the presence of God, not full of responsibilities and calling it quiet time. Number two, God showed me, I will show you the path, walk in it. He showed me that path. He showed me those tire tracks. He led me in that path. And when I went back the next day, I could find that kernel that I touched because I had walked in his path, the path that I showed you. And I bet I said it a hundred times. God was saying to me, I will show you the path, walk in it. I will show you the path, walk in it. I will show you the path, walk in it. Here's the point. You can be in proximity to someone and not be with someone. You can be talking to someone and not speaking with someone. God can speak to you. Read your Bible, meditate on his word, learn his word, study his word, share his word, hide his word in your heart. But God can speak. 
without you reading. Let me pray for you. Father, today in the name of Jesus, I pray that we get something out of this. I pray that you bless these people. I pray that you'd speak to them. I pray that you'd give them opportunities for quiet. I pray that as they begin to think, I don't have time for this, I won't have time for this, that they will make time. They will steal time. They will take time to be still and quiet, no matter what it takes. If it takes an alarm in the middle of the night to get out of bed or in the middle of the day to get out of bed and go sit somewhere in quiet without distractions, without phones, without watches, without notifications, and commune, share intimate feelings and intimate thoughts with each other. In Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen. I'm going to share more about the cornfield. I'm going to share more about my experiences in Kentucky. And I'm going to share more about the prodigal son. I will see you guys tomorrow on Friday. Hashtag live. Hashtag pre-recorded. Hashtag shared. Mm, listen to God today. Release some of those burdens. Give them to him. And let him talk to you. I love you guys. I got to go. Bye, guys.